I teach high school history, and a couple of years ago at a back to school meet the teacher night, I ran into a parent who had missed my talk, but we started talking, and he said who he was. I said, oh, I teach your son, and I'm a history teacher, and he said, oh, you're the Google Earth guy, and I said, yes, I am, and so I decided for this talk that I would be the Google Earth guy. Um, I've been using Google Earth in the classroom for about nine years. And I've made close to 4,000 place marks over that time. And, and you can use a collection of places to tell stories. And that's what I'm going to do for you today. And um, building on Jason's talk earlier this morning, I'm going to lead with why. So why you should use Google Earth um, is basically two reasons. One, it's a tremendous learning tool. And again, to build off of um, Cheryl's work, it, it's less about the teaching and more about being a learner first. So it's you seeing how Google Earth is useful and then sharing it with your students. Uh, and second, it's free. And so, therefore, you should use Google Earth. Thanks. Oh, I should, I should elaborate. Um, Google Earth also promotes empathy. It uh, prompts really good questions and it helps students make connections. Um, and ultimately, I think we've been talking a lot about storytelling today. I think Google Earth helps tell stories. So I'm going to share with you the doctor prescribed two, but I checked with her backstage, and she said it's okay to take three. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you three stories. The first story is about a class that I teach um, at the charter school where I work called um, Global Citizenship Seminar. And it's a group of 22 seniors, and we look at what's going on in the world today. I'm excited about the class, um, and it's been a, an exceptional opportunity to teach it. And the, um, the first speaker we were going to have, we have different speakers who come in, but a former colleague of mine, Ken Ako, agreed to video conference with my students. And if you Google Ken, you'll learn that he's a member of parliament in Kenya. And um, he grew up, it, it says over here, he first slept on a bed in high school, so he, he grew up in some pretty challenging conditions. Um, in a slum outside Nairobi that we'll look at in a moment. And I, I really wanted my students to be well prepared to talk with Ken about his experiences. Um, and they, my students did a great job, and this is actually a couple of stills from, um, this is my student Katie, who's asking Ken a question, and seven hours um, ahead in Kenya, Ken is uh, responding to her. It was a great session, and the way I prepared the students was by saying to them, okay, look, Ken grew up with his mother, five siblings, in a 12 by 12 foot, one room house. And you could draw a box that's 12 by 12, and students could get that some, but it's not alone, right? There, there are other houses around also, and Kibera is a very big place. Um, I should add also that Ken grew up without any running water and without electricity. And that's the case for the entire population of Kibera. So sort of keep that in mind as we start to look at this a little more. Um, if you Google Kibera, you'll get images similar to this. And you can see that um, sanitation is a problem. It's very packed in. And um, there's a map in the bottom corner there. And if we look at that, it's a fine map. And it shows you where Kibera is, but it's not dynamic. It's not interactive. And it's harder to walk in the shoes of people who are in Kibera just by looking at that map. And so I also had the opportunity to go to Kibera in the summer of 2009. So you all have been places where you can share with your students. And once you've been to a place, you can, you can tell a story better. Um, ideally, I'd take students with me. But next best, I think, is using Google Earth. So in order to show you what life is like in Kibera a little bit, um, I'm going to sit down and um, show you on, on Google Earth. And the, the premise here is that you need to use Google Earth for um, some conversations. So here's Google Earth. We'll make it a little bigger. And before we go to Kibera, I just want to, I think it's a good idea to do this with students in general. Just orient yourself to where you are. So we are in northern Delaware here at the Independent School. And I'll zoom in on the campus. I don't think this is on the right building, but I had to make these slides earlier. Um, let's turn off the photos for a second. And I'm just going to zoom out a little bit so that I can put a half mile square box around the campus. 
How do I know that's half a mile? Well, there's a measuring tool on Google Earth up here. And if I go in miles, it's about half a mile long. And you should do that probably for your school before you take students other places. Have them know what's in their neighborhood so they have a comparison point. Um, and the way you make a polygon like that is you just add a polygon. And if for some reason I wanted a triangle here, I could put one here. I don't, so I'm going to get rid of that. But these are pretty easy to make. Um, and if we zoom out to two miles, this is a rectangle that's two miles long and half a mile deep, so one square mile. And I drew it in a rectangular form for a, a reason that will become apparent in a moment. So with that background, let's head to Africa. If your students are typical, they probably don't know where Kenya is on this map. And if they think it's here or they think it's here, uh, we have a problem because Kenya is over here in the Horn of Africa. And as we zoom in to Kenya using Google Earth, um, I'm going to take you to Nairobi, which is the capital city. Nairobi is a city of about 3 million people. So if it were in the United States, it would be number three behind New York and LA. And if we turn the photos layer on for Google Earth, we can get a sense of what Nairobi looks like. It's a pretty modern, big, thriving city. And you may notice there's a golf course over here. And I call that to your attention because it's a good landmark. Right next to the golf course is Kibera. And Kibera is about two miles long and half a mile wide. And this should look familiar. So it's four times the size of the campus that we are at right now, except in that area is about half a million people with no running water and no electricity, except for a few on the margins who figure out ways to creatively get those things. But those services are not generally supplied in Kibera. Um, and if you zoom in a little bit, you can see there are a few roads. This road here is the main road, and there's a, a few smaller roads here. But to get most places in Kibera, you have to walk. And you have to walk through winding um, passageways that are uh, challenging to get through. And so if we zoom in here a little bit, multiple families would live in this one dwelling. And we mentioned before that Ken lived in a 12 by 12 house growing up with five siblings and his mother. That's a 12 by 12 house. And we would share that building with eight or nine other families. And in Ken's case, they had a pay toilet that they shared, but many folks would, um, there would be no running water for any of the families who were sharing that, that space. I think it can be hard for students to relate to that. So if we come back to the independent school for a moment, you may not have noticed this before, but there are some tennis courts right over here. And if we zoom in, that's 12 by 12 too. And I think that it starts to sink in for students and then students start asking good questions and they really start to empathize and they're wondering about all sorts of aspects of Ken's life and that's why we had such a good conversation um, because once I show you what life is like using Google Earth that statement conjures up that image for you um, and then this is I didn't think I'd have time to show a video in here so this is a still for a video but we visited in the dry season if you imagine this in the rainy season, all of the floor in this area, um, it turns to mud. And so again, more questions follow, but I think the point is that Google Earth definitely promotes empathy. Next time you see that, you'll picture the dynamic nature of, of Google Earth. My second story is when I had an opportunity to speak at a classroom recently um, at Duke, and I asked students, where are you from? And they said, you know, California and New York, one student said, I'm from Tibet. And I said, I want to see after class. Because um, it's not often that you get to talk to a student from Tibet. And we talked for a little bit, and then he agreed to meet me for lunch, and I brought my computer with me. And we sat down, and I said, can you show me on Google Earth where you're from? And he said, sure. I was a little worried. Like, is he going to be able to find his house? Does Google Earth know language? Are there any Tibetan landmarks? 
Um, turned out it wasn't hard at all for him to show me where he lived. We just went to China, and of course he took me to the Qinghai Lake. If you've never heard of it, don't worry, I've never heard of it either. Um, it's the largest lake in China, and it's 65 miles long. It's about the size of the Great Salt Lake in Salt Lake City, but the Great Salt Lake ends here, so it's, it's bigger if you look that up. Um, and so he knew, okay, here's a dam, and my community is right here off this edge of the water. And so he's telling me about his life, and he said, I went through first through sixth grade here, and then up the road a little bit, I went to, well, I didn't go to there, but he said they, the Chinese government had put up a military base there, and they made it clear that their presence um, is in his, uh, in his town. And then he was driving on Google Earth, and he started zooming out, and I said, oh, what's that? And he said, oh, that's interesting. It turns out, back in 2007, the Chinese government wanted to make nomads not be nomadic anymore. They wanted to have, the, they said it was hurting the environment. The student I was talking to said that people had been nomadic for hundreds of years, so that didn't seem to make sense. Um, but they built this housing for students. And something you can do with Google Earth is go back in time, show historical imagery. So when I click this, and take you back to 2007, the nomads are still nomadic. But sometime between February of 2007 and October of 2009, all those housing units were built. And to give you a sense again, this is where we are. And now you've got former nomads resettled in uniform houses, which is kind of hard for them to carry out their culture um, in that situation. And if you're cynical, you'd say the Chinese government is doing that um, on purpose. And so, um, a, a question I had is, would he be able, sorry, to, uh, to find his house? We did that. And so you, if you Google Tibetan nomads resettlement, it looks like what we were just looking at. Right? You can see the houses, and they're uniformly laid out. And now I've got this story, and I can look into more details and start searching it more online. Without Google Earth, I never would have seen that cluster of houses. And the student I was talking with never would have thought to tell me about it. And so what Google does when you use it in conversation is it prompts people to ask good questions, such as, what is that? Well, my third story um, is about what's going on right now in Syria. Your students are probably aware of this. Um, each middle or high school students, certainly, <clears throat> but probably even for some lower, um, lower school students. Um, what's going on in Syria? If you start doing some research, you could learn about the Zatari refugee camp. It's one of the larger camps, um, and it's just south of the border with Syria. Um, but I think you've got the pattern in the talk here. What does a Syrian refugee camp look like? Let's take a look. Um, and so let's go to Syria. And again, I think it's important, depending on your geographic knowledge of your students, you want to make sure they don't think it's here or here or here, because those are in Iran and Afghanistan. And those are important places to know about, but um, this is Syria over here. And if we go to the height where, that will help me show where refugees are, um, this is called add a overlay, add image. And so I found a map that helps me tell my story a little bit. Um, and so Syria, as you're aware, has about seven and a half, a little more than that, um, million people internally displaced. There's refugees in Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt, um, and also Jordan. And also, the, of course, they're fleeing up into um, Europe, and some coming to the U.S., I want to focus on Jordan for a minute. So if we zoom into the border with Jordan, and I have to turn the borders back on so we can see that. This is the Zatari refugee camp, and it's about seven miles from the border. So if you can get seven miles across to that refugee camp, um, you can get shelter in there. Um, and if we look at the camp, it's, it's huge and you could fit eight 
the campus where we are right now inside of there. And to give you another comparison point, Kibera would fit twice. So it's a pretty massive place, um, and it was built in 2013. There was no need for it before then because there was no Syrian civil war. And the reason they built it here is because there's an airstrip nearby for bringing provisions in, uh, but I'm not sure about that. So, and if you look forward, the images get a little funky here with the line, but um, you can see it getting more and more developed. And now today, it houses about 80,000 people, I believe. Um, and if we zoom in on some of the dwellings in here, they're about 12 feet by 12 feet, which seems to be the smallest size that people can practically live in, whether you're in Kibera, just outside of Nairobi, Kenya, or whether you are seven miles over the border from Syria into northern Jordan. Um, and so if we zoom out for a second back to the, uh, the camp, how did I find the camp? How did I know where that was? Well, on most Wikipedia pages, they give you the GPS coordinates. And so what you can do is copy those and paste them right into Google Earth. You can go in the search thing up here and you, and you paste that in. Sometimes you can type in what you're looking for. So if I type in Za'atari, it doesn't know the refugee camp, but it does know, strangely, where this runway is. And so sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you have to go to Wikipedia to get the coordinates, but you should be able to find most places um, by using a combination of just typing the name up here and um, entering the coordinates through Wikipedia. And so Google Earth, I think, really helps students to make connections. And so if they've studied um, Kibera, and they, they can relate it to that, if you've looked at your community, and we've, a, a number of speakers have talked about the importance of doing that community, um, they can connect it to that. And Google Earth, I think, ultimately helps you to tell stories. I told you three stories today, and when I pull up the Google Earth images of them, um, I think because I engage with Google Earth, you could engage with Google Earth with your students, it helps you to remember the story better. Your students also have stories. And for the strand that's coming up where we give students more voice and more power over their education, teach them how to use Google Earth, they'll teach you a little bit too. They're, they're quick at this, picking this thing up. Um, and then have them teach you using Google Earth. Um, so to come back where we started, Google Earth is a tremendous learning tool. It's free, and you should use Google Earth. I'm the Google Earth guy. And if you want more resources, if you go to bit.ly, Google Earth guy, um, bit.ly cares about capitalization, so you have to capitalize the G, the E, and the G. Um, there are resources there um, that'll help you learn more. Thank you very much.